And now we're going to continue where we left off last Sunday, <coughs> last in a series of three. But before I do, um, uh, my apologies that the Bible notes weren't printed last Sunday. They've been ready for well over a month, but I didn't get them printed. I forgot all about that. Um, so my apologies, they are ready this Sunday. Make sure you get them if you need them. So the great command of Jesus. Probably we would consider this to be the most important command of all. Love one another, said Jesus, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Let me just turn this. That's better. It's a bit bigger that way around. Last Sunday we considered three things. First of all, that Jesus is the greatest example of God's love. And then we began to consider what kind of love is it, this love of Jesus. And lastly, we looked at the agape love that a husband should have for his wife. And so we're going to continue looking at that agape love love and what it is. Because as we know, it is a love that is like no other love, simply because it is God's love. It is a love that is unique, because it is over and above all other kinds of love. And as we have seen, it is demonstrated to us supremely in Jesus. But this morning what we're going to do is going to have another look, or a, 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 another look yeah, at a different aspect of the love that Jesus commands us to love with. And it is this, love your enemies. And perhaps this, <coughs> perhaps this is the most controversial thing to say about agape love. And it is in, in a sense, it is this that makes us stand out from all other kinds of love. Jesus said these words, love your enemies, in what is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount, which we find in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 43 through to 48. And I'm going to read those to you. Jesus said this, he said, you have heard that the Lord of Moses says, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. <coughs> well, the world would go along with that. Probably most Christians would go along with that. But Jesus went on to say this, but he said, I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That goes against the grain. That's not natural. That's not normal. You know, people don't live like that. People don't think like that. And certainly you would have to say they are words that are not really infiltrated into the church very far. They're not infiltrated into my life or in your life to any great measure. But Jesus goes on to say, he says, it is in this way, that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. So therefore the implication is that if we're not doing this, then we're not acting as true children of our Father. Now that's quite something. And it, it, it's good for us just to stop for a moment and think about what the implications of these words are. That if we are not loving our enemies, we are not true children of our Father. If we have <coughs> any form of hatred within us, or even dislike, then we are not being true children of our Father in heaven. Jesus went on to say, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust too. He 
You see, that is so different to you and I. We are very quick, or, it, or it's very easy for us to, at times, withhold our love. Because somebody does something that hurts us. Somebody says something that grieves us. And at that moment we withdraw and we take away our love. But that's not what God does. Whatever you do, whatever I do, He never stops loving us. He doesn't say, well, Charles, you've not really made it today. You've really messed up. The sun's not going to shine on you. It'll shine on everybody else, but it won't shine on you. So I walk around in a cloud that's raining. Everybody else is in sunshine. No, God's not like that. Jesus went on to say, if you love only those who love you, what good is that? But that's the easy thing to do. That's the natural thing to do. Jesus said, even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how different are you from anyone else? Even the pagans, the unbelievers, do that. Now listen to these words. Oof. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Yeah, Jesus certainly said that, and Jesus was serious when he said it. So the first thing I want to say is, this is a hard and an unnatural thing for us to be doing. Because these words of Jesus may not sit very easily with you or with me or with anyone else for that matter. I'm sure we'd all agree that it's a great idea, it's a good idea to love our enemies. But the reality is that we will find it very difficult to do. By the very nature of this world, those who are our enemies are against us. And the chances are, we'll be against them. That's the nature of this world. They are antagonistic towards us. Your enemies, my enemies, what do they do? They seek to do us harm. They plan deceitful plots against us. They gossip about us. They lie about us. They slander us. They do everything that is unloving toward us because they don't like us. They may even hate us. They make it difficult for us to love them. And yet, Jesus said that we must love our enemies. And this is one thing that makes agape love very different from the love as the world understands it. The world in which you and I live, your neighbours, your relatives, your friends, they understand love in a totally different way. And they would be very much in line with what it was said in the law of Moses, love your neighbour but hate your enemy. The world is very much in that mindset of hating our enemies. It's the natural thing to do. And the world is tainted with that rust that wants to destroy its enemies. Why do you think the arms race is such good business? It's because the world is full of enemies that wants to blast everybody else off the face of the earth. The world wants to hit back. And we want to hit back. You want to hit back. I want to hit back when somebody says something that I don't like, that upsets me. What's the natural reaction? A verbal black eye, if you can. 
But we, all we know is that if you give a verbal black eye, you're likely to get one back again as well. And you both finish up with verbal black eyes. But that's the natural reaction, but Jesus says this. He tells us that we should love our enemies. Actually, Jesus never said that we should love our enemies. He said, you must, you must love your enemies. It is a command. So Jesus commands us to love our enemies. Therefore, that means that every believer in Jesus has no option but to see, to try and obey this command of Jesus. Love your enemies. Now let us consider for a moment, just for a moment, how many lives would have been saved if Christians had have loved their enemies. Think throughout the centuries. All the amount of people that have been killed by Christians. Christians killing Christians. Christian countries going to war against Christian countries. All that would have been avoided if the church had taken on board these words of Jesus. Love your enemies. Consider how many wars would have been avoided if Christians had have loved their enemies. Consider how much heartache would have been avoided if Christians had have loved their enemies. But let's make it more personal. Consider how much less heartache you and I would have if we loved our enemies. But you might come back and you might say, but it's impossible. It really is impossible to love our enemies. And you may say, but our enemies, they actually don't deserve our love. Think about what we just said. And then think, do you, do I, deserve God's love? No. No. But he still loves us. And would Jesus command something if it were not possible? He would command us to do something that we couldn't do. Now I want to read something from God's Word that you may have read before. And it may be familiar to you. It comes from Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. And Paul writes this, he said, For if, while we were God's enemies, now just listen to that. That is saying, we were God's enemies. You were, I was. If, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And the whole point is this. We were God's enemies, but God didn't leave us there. He sent Jesus into the world to die in our place so that we could become his friends. And that is what we are. You see, you were God's enemies. I was God's enemy. And the truth of the matter is, before we actually come to Jesus, before we receive Him as our Lord and Saviour, we are all God's enemies. Now it's not me that's saying that, I'm repeating what's in God's Word. And that's my responsibility to bring God's Word to you. Before anybody comes to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, they are God's enemies. But as we've already seen, God did not wait for us to become good or even to become his friends before he sent Jesus to die for us. And that is the wonderful thing about the love of God. That's the great thing about the grace of God. He didn't wait for you and I to become good. He didn't wait for you and I to become friends. He didn't wait for you and I to stop being his enemies before he sent Jesus. 
because if he had waited, then we'd still be his enemies. When Jesus left heaven and came into this world to save sinners, it was at a time when you and I were still the enemies of God. He came into a world that was full of his enemies. And we can see this, the, the, you know, the nativity story. What was happening to Jesus as a little baby? Herod wanted to kill him because Herod was the enemy of Jesus. And Jesus experienced that right throughout his life and throughout his ministry. Until eventually, of course, his enemies took him to Pilate, who had him condemned to death. But that didn't stop Jesus coming into the world to change us from being his enemies into being his friends. But the truth of the matter is that every human being that is ever born is an enemy of God and remains so until they receive Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And yet, all the great thing is, that while we are still his enemies, God loves us. And God is asking us to do no more than what he has done and is doing for you and I. To love us. And the love and the desire of love is to turn enemies into friends. That's God's desire. God's desire isn't that everybody should remain as his enemy. No. The point of his loving us is to make us his friends. That is to reconcile us to himself. As we've seen, every human being is the enemy of God and remains so until coming to Jesus. And that is why Jesus died for us on the cross. He died as the supreme act of love in order to reconcile us to God, in order to make us the friends of God, no longer enemies. This is the reconciliation of the love of God. He loves to change us. He loves to change people from being his enemies into being his friends. That's what he wants for you and I today. That's what he wants for our enemies to become friends of Jesus. Therefore, when Jesus says that we must love our enemies, it is so that they might be changed from being our enemies into being our friends. This is the God-given agape love that we see demonstrated in Jesus. Now, the the fact is, loving our enemies may work, or it may not work. You may find that your enemies do become your friends, but you may also find that they don't. That's just how it was and is with God. God in Jesus loves all his enemies. How many respond and become his friends? We are blessed if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior that we have responded to him and are no longer his enemies but we are his friends. The majority of people that you know will probably remain as the enemies of God and that's a real, real sad fact. Your neighbors with some of our relatives who will remain as the enemies of God because they refuse to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Does that stop God loving them? No. Should it stop us loving them? No. We keep on loving. And just as that is true for God, it is going to be true for you and I that even though we may begin to love our enemies, we really do need to do that. 
they will be some who will still remain enemies and not become friends. Love, you see, does not necessarily conquer all. You've heard that expression, love conquers all. <laughs> it's not true. If love conquered all, everybody would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But the truth of it is, we, humanity, can reject the loving advances of God and choose to remain as his enemies. And the same will be true for you and I as we carry out the command of Jesus to love our enemies. There will be those, probably most of them, who will refuse to receive that advancement of love. But we have to say, don't we, that responding to the command of Jesus to love our enemies is far better than to hate them. To hate our enemies or even to dislike them goes against the command of Jesus for one thing, and it can also be disastrous for our own health. <coughs> the cause of some illnesses, not all of them, but some illnesses can be attributed to people hating other people. It really can be disastrous for our health. <coughs> the command of Jesus that we must love our enemies is given in part to remove from us the crippling nature of hatred. Hatred does cripple. And it also improves and increases our band of friends. So Jesus says, you must Love your enemies. Doesn't mean to say we also have to agree, but we do have to love. In any relationship, there's going to be disagreements of some sort or another. That doesn't stop us loving. If it stopped us loving, then the disagreement would be disastrous. Jesus says, Love one another. Love your enemies. And lastly, I just want to move on to looking at the nature, uh, another aspect of the nature of love. And perhaps all of us will have thoughts as to what the nature of love is. For some it's friendship and nothing more. For others it might be romance and nothing more. For others it, they equate love with loyalty or sharing a life together. And undoubtedly all these things are, are part of love and are good in themselves. However, we need to discover the meaning of God's love. And therefore we need to go to God's Word to do that. As we've already seen, Jesus is the supreme demonstration of the true nature of God's love. Now Paul in his letter to the Corinthians has given us a glimpse. I'll say that again. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians has given us a glimpse of the true nature of the love of God. And I'm going to read it to you from 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 5. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy and it does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease where there are tongues, they will be stilled, and where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Now perhaps we're all aware that this is a familiar part of Scripture that is often read at weddings. And uh, we're going to be reading it in a uh, week on Saturday, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. Coming around pretty quick. 
And it's very well, it's because actually when you think about it, it is, the, it is the best foundation that there is for any Christian marriage, for any marriage for that matter. However, these words are not given particularly for marriage. We just like to use them for marriage. Instead, they are given to us as the foundation of how we should love one another and how we should love our enemies. Now the reason I say this is because it is the same Greek word that is used in, by Paul as we find in the new command of Jesus. The word agape. And Paul really does illustrate what it means. So let's look at the description of love again in a little more detail. Love is patient. It's patient endurance. What does that mean? It means it per perseveres patiently and bravely enduring misfortune and troubles. And we will all experience misfortune and troubles. And love perseveres through them. It endures the offences and injuries that other people will cause us. It is long-suffering and steadfast. It doesn't give up. True love, the love of God, does not give up. That's great. Love is kind. What does that mean? That means it is gracious. That means love favours others who don't deserve our love, who don't deserve to be favoured. That's what it is when it says love is kind. And God has demonstrated his kindness, his love to us. He's gracious towards us and we don't deserve it. Love is not spiteful. That means it doesn't get jealous. Neither does it love to become envious. And it doesn't boil over with hatred or anger. That's of the world. Love is not boastful. In other words, there's no bragging with love. It's not ostentatious. I thought, I wonder if I know what ostentatious means, so I put in brackets, flamboyant, showing off, in other words. Love's not puffed up, it's not proud, not full of hot air, not full of self-importance, it's never vain, it's not arrogant. Not aloof. Love is not indecent. It does not act in an unbecoming manner or shameful manner. It does nothing to cause others to blush or to embarrass someone in the wrong way. Love it doesn't seek the things of itself. It is selfless. It doesn't want its own way. Well, I guess there's not one of us here can say that we've not wanted our own way. Yet love, the love of God, does not want its own way. It always prefers the ways of others and their interests. I'll rephrase that, it always prefers others, not necessarily their ways, but prefers others and their interests. <coughs> Love's not irritable. <laughs> well, who's never got irritable? I notice not one hand has gone up. Notice some are holding other people's hands down. <laughs> Love's not irritable. 
It does not provoke anger. It's not touchy. Oh my goodness. And it doesn't exasperate others or frustrate them. Wow. We've got some way to go, haven't we, folks? Love. This is a real serious, we're all serious. Love does not calculate evil. That is, it doesn't dwell on or consider the evil or the wrong things that other people are doing. It doesn't ponder on evil. It doesn't sort of dwell on what others are doing. It doesn't register the evil that others are doing and keep a record of it in the recesses of the mind, storing it up as resentment. How many people do that? I'll not forget that. You know, have you heard people say that? Have you said it? I'll remember that one day. I will come back to visit you. Those chickens have come back to roost. But actually we laugh, it's not funny. Because part of not loving our enemies, a part of loving our enemies is not to keep a record of the wrongs that people do. <coughs> it means we bear no malice to anyone. And I'll say it again, it means we do not count up the wrongs that somebody has done against us. Because you can be absolutely certain, if you're counting up the wrongs that, you, that somebody has done against you, they're probably counting up the wrongs that you've done against them. Love, it doesn't rejoice over unrighteousness of heart and life. I mean, that means it finds no pleasure in injustice. And we're uh, uh, discovering at the moment, aren't we, with this uh, terrible immigrant situation, um, that there's a change of mood in the country as people are seeing the destitution that is happening with people uh, coming, trying to get into, into Europe, not just this country. And people are seeing the injustice of it. I haven't a clue what the answer is. But we need to pray about it. Love, it doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It's not happy about the downfall of others. And you cannot help but be moved when you see that some of these people have been travelling for months, some for years, from parts of Africa and Asia, fleeing from persecution and almost certain death. We don't rejoice in seeing that downfall. Moving on, love rejoices with the truth. It's always delighted when there is honesty and when there is integrity. Love, it protectively covers all things. There are things that need to be kept private. And there are things that need to be kept secret. And love will do that. You know, we were, Brian was saying the other day, he said, if somebody gives you a secret, it's no longer a secret the moment you tell somebody else. <laughs> well, that's true. And if our desire to share a secret, or if our desire is to share a secret, then our desire to love them has flown out the window. Because love will keep the secret. Love does not get involved in gossiping. Oh dear. You've been involved in gossiping, I've been involved in gossiping. None of us have avoided that one. But we need to seek to try and avoid gossiping and sharing secrets with people who shouldn't have that secret. Love always gives support to those who need it without announcing it, without a big song and dance about it. Look what I'm doing. Love is persuaded of all things. I.e., what does that mean? It gives credit to all things. 
thinks the best first and has confidence in others giving the benefit of the doubt. Love hopes all things. That is the hope in a spiritual sense, really, of awaiting the salvation and joy of Jesus with confidence. Love bravely and calmly endures all things. Love, the love of Jesus, agape love, has a stickability. Now I'm not sure whether that's one word or two words. I put it as one word. Stickability. Uh, my dictionary wanted to go on word correct wanted to put it as two words, but I thought it was two words. Anyway, you know what I mean? It's got stickability. It stays, it remains. Stays the course. It doesn't proceed back. But how many of us do that at times? Love never falls down. This is agape love. It never falls into sin. So the moment we fall into sin, and we do every day, at that moment we've stopped a certain part of love. And we've transferred that love to the love of sin. And we can all identify that we do that at times, don't we? And we know that at the end of the day, and probably many times during the day, we have to repent. Say, so, Lord, got it on again. And come back and love. Love is never powerless to bring help in some form or another. Love does not perish. It doesn't wear out. Isn't that good? You know, you're just about to start out on your married life. And uh, some of us have been on it a long time. And we can say those of us have been on it a long time, and you know, I know Brian and Doc have been on it much longer than us. Well, I wouldn't say much longer, but longer. <laughs> love doesn't wear out, it gets stronger. And this is the love of Jesus. Love for one another, love for our enemies gets stronger as the years go by. If it doesn't, something's gone wrong along the line. And we need to get back to the love of Jesus. Love does not fall from a position it cannot keep. These, these are the descriptions of the love of God as seen in Jesus. And therefore there is one word that sums up all these various elements of love and it is Jesus. Look at Jesus and you will see this agape love. The love that loves enemies into being friends. The love that has brought to you and I the grace of God as displayed in Jesus. Well, you may be thinking, well, that's a love in such a way is far beyond the reach of anyone. Hey, you may, may be thinking it's far beyond your reach. At times I may think it's far beyond my reach. However, Jesus did not leave us a command that is beyond our <coughs> reach. Instead, he has given us a command to obey that is very available. And this is how, in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, we read these words, God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Did you hear that? God has poured out His love into our hearts. So He's not asking us to love with our love, but He's asking us to love with the love that He's poured into our hearts. And notice it says, he has poured his love into our hearts. Not that he will, it's not a promise that is yet to come. It is a promise that's always ongoing by means of the Holy Spirit. And I want to conclude this morning by simply saying this. If you want to receive this love of God, you can do so right now. If you know that you're struggling to love your enemies, or even to love one another as Jesus commanded us, and I want to assure you, you can receive His love to enable you to do that right now, this morning. 
If you know that the way you love is not God's way of loving, and you want to come in line with God's love, then you can do so. Right now. And what better way could there be to end our time together this morning than to receive this amazing love of God. So I'm going to invite us all to stand right now so that we can receive the agape love of God through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let's open our hearts and open our minds to receive the love of God. God does not disappoint us. He does not tease us. He wants us to be a people filled with His love. A love that transforms relationships. Firstly, first of all, transforming our relationship with Him and transforming our relationship with other people. You might just want to open your hands out. Hold them, stretch them out before you to receive the love of God. And I'm going to pray for us right now. Heavenly Father, you brought your word to us this morning about loving one another and about loving our enemies. And we recognize, Lord, that this is a task that is beyond our own human efforts, beyond our own human understanding. But Lord, we want to be a people who obey you. We want to be a people who are filled with your love. And therefore, I pray right now, Heavenly Father, that by your Holy Spirit you will tip into our hearts your everlasting love. So that we can obey your command to love one another, even as you love us, Lord Jesus. To love our enemies, even as you love. And as we stand here this morning, Lord, we receive your love. We say thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking us from being enemies to being your friends. And we pray that as we go out into this world, as we mix with our friends, our neighbours, our work colleagues, our relatives who do not know. Lord, help us to love with the love that you love us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.